This is the Bethany Bible Church Channel. I'm Pastor Ron Vandermeer with another message in our series on the end of the world. Our title today, The Beast from the Sea. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Let's look to the Lord in a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you as we come now to the second half of the book of Revelation. We see everything winding down as history itself approaches the end. We know that you are always in control. You are sovereign over everything. Lord, you're sovereign even over the difficulties that we have right now in our own lives. Lord, I ask you to give a special touch to each viewer today. May they feel your presence in their life. May they feel you directing them, guiding them through the storms of life and also enjoying all the blessings of life. May we always remember that it's all from you and we give praise and glory to your holy name. And it is in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. The revelation of the Antichrist unfolds here in chapter 13. The person of the Antichrist was found in verse 1 and his authority in verse 2, the esteem for the Antichrist in verse 3, his recovery from a fatal wound is also there in verse 3, and then there's the resultant worship. And we'll look at some of these areas today. First, his person. Verse 1 states, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now this word translated beast is the same word that we found in chapter 11, also description of the Antichrist. And in Greek, it does refer to a wild, ferocious, vicious monster. A beast is similar to the beasts in Daniel's dreams in the Old Testament. And uh, certainly like those, the beast represents not only a person, but a kingdom. It represents a kingdom because of the complex description that is given in these verses. And that kingdom, I believe, is the revived Roman Empire. And of course, there is a person, the Antichrist, who will lead that. And so both are to be seen in this term, the beast. The sea itself, many have their own thoughts as to what that might be. I believe it represents, once again, the restless nations that will be always uh, fighting against each other and the beast will rise out of the nations. Uh, This is in contrast to what we will see in the next part of this chapter where the false prophet comes out of the earth. Secondly, in verse 2, we read this. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And that's the key word, authority. The authority that we have here for the Antichrist is given to him by Satan, who is the dragon. The lion was a fitting symbol of a fierce, consuming power. Represents perhaps Babylon, as it did in the Old Testament. In the book of Daniel, the bear symbolizes ferociousness, strength, stability. The Medo-Persians were there in uh, Daniel chapter 8, and they are also, I believe, right here mentioned with this fierceness. It's It's a hark back to the Persian Empire. The leopard, fitting symbol of the swift conquests of the Greeks, done with speed and viciousness. And this was, of course, a person as well as a nation, Alexander the Great being the person. 
And so there's that element in here. All three of these elements are in this final beast. The fourth beast, which is filled with all that was there before, plus more. And Satan will give his power, his throne, his authority to the beast. He'll indwell the Antichrist and make him the most powerful man on earth. Verse 3 gives another thought. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. The Antichrist receives a fatal wound. It uh, could be a death wound. Uh, it doesn't say whether the death is real or fake, but I believe it is fake. Uh, and that uh, it is a mimicking of the resurrection of Christ, but with deceit, as Satan is so good at deceit. This perhaps is one of those lying wonders that we find in the Bible mentioned that will be done by the false prophet, whom we'll meet uh, in the next section of this book. Next we have his worship. Revelation 13, verse 4. As they worship the Antichrist, they will cry out in awe, and that's what we read in verse 4. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? The answer to those questions, of course, is no one. The language that is reserved there should be for God alone, but here now it goes to this beast. And this Antichrist will reign supreme, perhaps unchallenged by earth. And he will have this great power. No one is able to wage war. Wow. His vanity, seen in verses 5 and 6, says there, And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Now, you know, a blasphemer is one who curses God or makes little of God or who denies the truths of God and then perhaps sets himself up or sets up someone else to be God. Daniel saw these arrogant words given by the little horn there in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, the arrogance and the blasphemy that will surpass uh, anything that's been said before in human history, the Antichrist will make it worse. He will be the mouthpiece of Satan and express that rage that Satan has against God. These blasphemies, this reign of terror, will go on for 42 months. Now, that's the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And then he'll be cut off. He'll be stopped, be destroyed. Satan and the Antichrist will only be allowed to act in this time limit that is set for them by the real sovereign of the universe, and that is the Lord God himself. Verse 7 speaks of the actions of the Antichrist. It says, It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Because the saints refuse to worship the beast, they will have the wrath of the Antichrist upon them. And notice God is always sovereign. He's the one who allows this to take place. This persecution will solidify his hold on the world. And God will actually give into his hand the authority over every tribe, people, tongue, and nation. They'll submit to his rule They'll worship him as God, and if they don't, they die. 
His followers are mentioned in verses 8 to 10. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Wow, think of the spectacle of all who dwell on the earth at this point as having chosen to worship the beast rather than the Lord of life. They have really chosen poorly. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says that they will perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. You know, we have seven times a mention of this book of life. Perhaps it's a registry of some sort in which God has written the names of those chosen for salvation before the foundation of the world. We don't know exactly what it will look like, but it's there and names will be in it, names of those who have been chosen before the foundation of the world. Did you know that as a believer in Christ, you are doubly secure? John tells us that the book of life belongs to the Lamb who was slain. We're chosen and written in this book our names long ago, before the foundation of the world. Peter wrote in First Peter 1, 18 and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, those who put their faith in Jesus Christ during the tribulation, agreeing with God that they are sinners, helpless to do anything to change their condition, but believing that Jesus Christ died for their sins, paying the penalty required for sin, that he was buried and three days later rose from the dead. These people who are destroyed, killed by the Antichrist, he can't destroy their faith, though. And that will never take place. There's a truth here. That uh, when we leave this world, whether it's through uh, persecution or that we live a long life and go into God's presence, either way, we go into God's presence and we will be rejoicing. And those who die during this tribulation period will truly count themselves worthy to have died for the cause of Christ, been martyrs, so that others might see their faith and believe. And I believe that will take place in the end days. You know, God never releases his control on the earth. He remains sovereign always. Sometimes it seems like Satan and the Antichrist are unchecked, even in the world today. They can do whatever they want. But no, God is always the sovereign ruler. We must recognize that and remember it every day. And that brings us to a very important topic. Have you received the salvation that God is offering? Is your name written in glory? Is it in that Lamb's book of life? Is it doubly secure? Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead. Do you believe that? If you do, you have eternal life, and you will be in heaven someday. Trust him today. Accept Christ's death, burial, and resurrection as applying to you. You believe that he has redeemed you, that he has paid the penalty for your sins, and you repent of those sins and accept the Savior. One day, you will enter the presence of God, thanks to what Christ has done for us. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you again that we can come and rejoice and thank you for our marvelous grace that reaches us poor sinners and brings us to salvation. Nothing that we deserve, like the hymn says, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And we do cling to that cross, that cross of redemption. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for our sins, rising again for our justification, and redeeming us from this world, which is filled with devils, but one day it will all change, and there'll be a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness will reign eternally. We thank you, Lord, for your word today. Bless it to our hearts. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you all.